Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day that you have given to us, a day that you have made. And we rejoice in it. We rejoice in you. You are our wonderful God. And you have revealed yourself in the scriptures. Yes, these are ancient words, but they are ever true. Why? Because you are living. And so your word is living. So we pray that these ancient living words would ever guide us in the way that we are to walk, in the way that we are to talk, in the way that we are to live. And we pray, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in the book of James, or James's letter. Again, we said that this letter is going out to really everybody. It really is going out to everybody. He does not address this uh, to a specific city or a specific region. He kind of does a great big wide uh, casting out of this letter because it's going to the diaspora. Well, the diaspora, the, the Jews in the dispersion or the believers in the dispersion, they're everywhere. They're simply everywhere because God has dispersed them in the nations. And, and so James is this awesome little letter. It's very practical. It is practical Christianity. He, unlike some other, of the other writers in Scripture that you really have to dig into, he puts it right on top, and it's like, okay, here it is. Do you get it? <laughs> and so this is his point today. He says, my brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. What did he just say? Don't show favoritism. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Don't show favoritism. Just in case, however, his readers don't get the point. He gives an example of what it would be to show favoritism. He says, suppose a man comes into your synagogue wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here, 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 here. This is a very fine seat. Sit here. And you say to the poor man, just stand over there. Or here, just sit by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, because... Human beings are really good at deceiving ourselves. Because we're really, really good at deceiving ourselves, we could say that, um, but we're just loving the rich person by showing him this wonderful seat. <laughs> well, you know how it is. We get our things, I mean, our minds get all messed up here. Because, because we don't want to be outed. We don't want to, to think that we might possibly be discriminating against anybody. We say, well, we, we were being loving. Well, what about this poor guy? How loving is it to go stand over there? Sit here by my feet? Excuse me, this is not loving. There is a discrimination going on here. Is there not? Yes. So he says, listen. Listen. My dear brothers, you know, if you have discriminated in any way, then you become judges with evil thoughts. So he says, listen. Again, this is a command. Listen. Just like don't show favoritism is a command. Don't show favoritism. So he says, listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith 
and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. Now, the poor, in the, in the eyes of the world, they are not going to be inheriting the kingdom of God because they're poor. I mean, there, there's no merit there for eternal life because you're poor. The fact that they are poor isn't it. They merit eternal life and inheritance with the Father because they have faith in God. It's always about faith in God. It's always about believing in Jesus Christ. The poor, they are not relying on their wealth because they have none in the eyes of the world. We've already talked about this in James' letter. The rich have a hard time believing because they have wealth to fall back on. Not so the poor. The poor don't have that worldly wealth. And so they rely on God. Now that's not to say that everybody who is poor in the eyes of the world does have this great faith in God. That's not true either. But he's trying to make a point here. He's saying, don't show favoritism. Somebody comes driving up in a Mercedes and they get out and they're decked out and you know they've got a thousand dollar haircut which I don't know where you'd find one of those personally uh, but maybe you can and you, you see them coming in and going oh look at this I don't know if I want to say this or not <laughs> like, okay let's vote do you want to hear this or not <laughs> I'm not going to let you vote but you know, this is what some, con some people will do, okay? If they see somebody coming in that they know has money, they'll go, oh, let's court this person because they'd really help our treasury. Is that not a possibility that people would think that? Yeah. How terrible to think that, you know, the dollar that somebody puts in to the offering plate is worth less than whatever a rich person might put in. Which, by the way, may not be anything. <laughs> because they spent it all on their stuff. Think about that. Just think about it. I just thought you needed to know that. Just in case you hadn't thought about it. Then, then James goes on to say, he gives him a reality check. He says, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Aren't they the ones with the money that can take you to court? Aren't they the ones dragging you into court? Well, here, the people dragging the believers into court were most likely the religious leaders, the Jews that were against this new move of God. Don't we know that Paul, he was Saul, got permission from the leaders in Jerusalem to go after, even in another city, even to Damascus, to go and arrest the people who belonged to Christ, belonging to the way. It was called the way back then. And he said, and to bring them to court. Well, it was the religious leaders who had wealth in those days. They had wealth. And on top of that, he goes on to say, aren't they the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? So it kind of pinpoints who he's talking about here. He's not talking about Romans. He's talking about Jewish people who don't believe in Messiah, who have some anxiety, a lot of anxiety, over this new sect of Jews because they believe in Messiah Christ. And so he's saying, get a clue. If they are coming to your meeting, maybe they don't have good intentions. It's a possibility. But if you show favoritism, you have made a distinction. You've made a distinction. And remember, God shows no partiality whatsoever. He treats everybody the same. 
And so he says, he goes on to say, he says, if you will keep the royal law found in Scripture. You know, some of the times our, the Holy Spirit moves the writers to use a term we're not familiar with so that we can de dig deeper into the word. And you go, well, what in the world is the royal law? Well, thankfully, he goes on to tell us what the royal law is. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. It's the second that, you know, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then he says, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So the royal law is to love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you do this, you are doing right. If you do this, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. I mean... Anybody ever been stopped for speeding? Just a few people. Maybe not everybody. <laughs> I don't know if it was when I got stopped one time or not. Or if I just heard this story. I don't know, I could just be in denial. <laughs> so you just never know. <laughs> you just never know. Oh, don't. <laughs> I should have been in denial. Oh. Stop. Oh. <laughs> anyway, when the cop comes to the window, yes, officer, did you know where you're spinning? I said, I, I don't know if I, it, somebody said something to the effect of, yeah, but a lot of other people were too, they were passing me. And the response of the cop was this. When you go fishing, do you catch every fish in the, in the lake? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, now there you go. <laughs> I got caught. <laughs> and you know, he's not going to he's not going to say, "Yeah, but you know, every, every other time that you've come by this intersection, you've done it correctly." <laughs> You know, he is not going to talk, of, he is not going to grade me on the 99 times he saw me pass by going at the speed limit. <laughs> I remember one time, I was on my way to church, no less, and um, there, was a, there was a speed trap. Came around the corner, and there were some cops sitting there on the side of the road. And all that man had to do is point his finger at me and go, whoop. <laughs> Just bring his finger toward me. Come here. Like a, I'm going to church. You'll get there late. <laughs> get into church. Mom goes, why are you late? I got a ticket. Okay. <laughs> if we break the law in one place, you've broken it all. Right? You've broken it all. And then he goes on to say, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. The rule for how we are to walk as Christians has been settled in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I'm going to take a little, little tiny little rabbit trail here and just say, folks, that one can be really hard if you don't love yourself. That one can be really, really hard if we don't love ourselves. If we have a poor self-image, a poor self-esteem. It can be really hard to love everybody else because we're not so sure about whether or not we love us. But here's what we've got to do. We've got to look at the scriptures and see what God says about us and take our cue from what he says about us. Not about what our head and our heart may be saying about us, because our feelings can betray us. They can deceive us. God says we are of 
infinite worth in his eyes. So much so that he sent his only begotten son into the world to take upon himself our sin, our guilt, our diseases, our shame. He put it all onto his son because his love for us is so great. And then he says, go and love everybody else like I love you. And so if we say to ourselves that we aren't worth loving, we are judging God. Let's not do that. He's got the bigger picture. And he has said, I love you. You are of infinite worth to me. I sent my son to save you and rescue you. I can't love you any more than I do, and I'm not going to love you any less. There's nothing you can do that can ever stop me from loving you. So, take it from me. I love you. And then let's start changing our attitudes toward ourselves. Because God says we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. So we love ourselves so that we can love our neighbors. That's the rule we are to live by as believers in Christ Jesus. It is a royal law. It comes from the king. So that makes it royal. That makes it royal. Then he goes on to say, he says, So speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. That sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? Putting the word law and freedom together. But we know in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, Paul writes, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The gospel is law. That sounds weird too. But how is it possible? Because it has the prerequisites of law. It has rewards and punishments. It just has, this is how you're supposed to live. This is how you're not supposed to live. Isn't that part of law giving? And it was given to us by the lawgiver himself, God. So that by of itself is reason enough to call it law. But it gives us freedom. The law that Moses was given from Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, keeping them cannot bring us freedom. They cannot bring us freedom. They show us our sin. They don't show us how to become free. The law that is Christ, Christ Jesus, the giver of this, this new covenant, the one who in his own body shed his blood so that the covenant could be ratified, this law frees us. Why? Because Jesus kept the whole law perfectly. He kept it because we could not keep it perfectly. He knew we couldn't keep it perfectly, so he came and he kept it for us. So that now that he has kept it for us, now that he has set us free, now we are free to live this law, live this gospel, in a way that we could not have before. Before we were under the constraints. We, we, had, we had chains binding us. We were oppressed by the law of sin and death. Christ Jesus set us free. Now we are free to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now we are free to even love our enemies. Now we are free to love us, ourselves. This freedom, it is perfect. It sets us at liberty from anything in the world that could ever bind us. Now, it's this law that we will be judged by. How did we judge our neighbors? I mean, how did we treat our neighbors? How did we treat those that were our enemies? In other words, if we don't want to call it a law, call it a standard by which we are to live. And we're to be judged by this. We'll be judged by this. Did we live it or not live it? Okay? One of the things that we know from the scriptures is this. And this is verse 13. He says, 
judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. That's an ooh, yeah. Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Think in terms of the parable of the unforgiving servant that's in Matthew chapter 18. This man owed his master just an enormous amount of debt. So much so, he would never, ever, ever be able to pay it back. Even though he got on his knees and he said, Have mercy on me and I will pay you back in full. The master had mercy on him. And so he went his way and went to a fellow servant who owed him something like $60. Grabbed him by the throat and said, Pay me what you owe. Well, the man couldn't, even though he got on his knees and said, Have mercy on me and I will pay you everything that I owe. The one who had been forgiven much did not forgive. He threw that man in the dungeon until he should pay his entire debt. Well, all the other servants saw it and reported to the master. And the master called in the unforgiving servant and told him, I forgave you all that debt that you owed me, and yet you couldn't forgive this little bit that he owed you? He said, now you will be thrown in the dungeon and tormented until you should pay it all back. Well, he's not going to ever be able to pay it all back. You see, he, was, he refused to give mercy to the one who asked for mercy. His master gave him mercy, showed him mercy, but he refused to give it to somebody else. We all, in Christ Jesus, have been shown mercy. We need to then live our lives extending that mercy to everybody else around us. James writes, mercy triumphs over judgment. It always does. Mercy always triumphs over judgment. And let me show you you see this cross, the crosses we have up here? Judgment and mercy came together at the cross. You see, the law said the sinner must die. That's what the law said. He who sins shall die. The wages of sin is death. So God couldn't just let us off. He couldn't turn in a blind eye and say, well, I don't see what they're doing. He had to do something about it. So he says, I know what I will do. I will send my only begotten son and he, I will put all of their sin, all of their junk, all of their stuff on him. I will put on him the punishment they deserve. He's going to die the death they should die instead. And then I'm going to extend my mercy to them. So what happened at the cross is judgment and mercy met. The judgment of God was satisfied, but mercy triumphed. Mercy triumphed. Yes, judgment of God was satisfied, but mercy triumphed because God then extended all of his mercy onto us. You see, this is how we will then be judged. Do we extend what we have received to other people? Will we show favoritism to people when everybody should be treated the same? How are we going to live? Again, James is very practical. Very, very practical when it comes to how he writes this message. And it's up to us again, to do what he writes, because again, we are told that we are to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So what will we do? My prayer is, of course, is that we will take all of this to heart and begin, if we aren't already, really pondering this and, and saying, okay, this is what I'm sensing the Lord is directing me to do. Please know that none of us can do this on our own without God's help. Because 
the world is a very, very evil place. It's impossible to turn the cheek once somebody has slapped it unless we belong to Jesus Christ. But that's what we're told to do. So we need Holy Spirit working in us. So we aren't supposed to show favoritism. Anybody who walks through these doors needs to receive a welcome and love. They need to know that God's love is here. God's people are here. And so I pray that that is indeed what we will do from now on. If we haven't before, from now on. Ponder this word. But I, you know, I sense that really the, the one word that needs to be pondered today is this one. Let's love ourselves as God loves us. Let's love ourselves as God loves us so that we can extend that love then to everybody else. Because it's real hard to follow the, the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself, if we don't love ourselves. So let's look at ourselves from God's perspective so that we can live our lives from God's perspective. Amen.